this afternoon and um, as part of Culture Now series um, ongoing, we, we meet um, Johnny Chan Kidd and we're going to talk through um, some images which are going to come up on the screen which um, you kindly brought through most of them, although there'll be some that you haven't seen exactly. Big surprise. Big surprises at the front centre. Um, but uh, uh, and a, a partner for some informality between myself and Johnny is someone I've known for some time. Um, but uh, I think we should just go to the first image. Obviously, I've known Johnny as someone who's very um, shy and retiring and uh, that hardly ever goes out. And, uh, <laughs> and I just wondered if we could just start with this first image. If you could. Uh, oh, if you could. Uh, Yeah. Maybe you can explain to me what's going on there. <laughs> it's a picture that has never been allowed to be printed because the lady on the left looked like a body like the size. Um, it was just a, a, I don't know, I just, a, in the mid 90s I started taking photographs of artists in a completely informal way and this is just a sort of ludicrous um, picture of Damien looking very chuffed with himself between Posh Beckham and Elizabeth Hurley. Um, but as I said, it hasn't been shown before because um, Madam Beckham didn't like her. Who's, who's, the, person, who's the lady on the, on the right? Uh, it's uh, it's on, uh, kind of Nicola Formby, I think her name is. But it's, um, I mean, a sort of meaningless picture, but I just think David looks so pleased with himself. It's very entertaining. <laughs> tell us what, and, and here's Emin. I think this is, can you tell me where this is? This is the French Hedra. Yeah. And this is um, the constant invitation you have from a, a, a lady collector, Pauline Carl Peters, who um, has, has asked you to photograph everyone on this Greek island. Yes, it's a, every summer it's a great, she's a fabulous lady called Pauline Carl Peters, um, and she's a Mancunian who married a Greek um, property, I mean a developer, and she's, she's a great collector, and once a year she uh, has an exhibition that opens on the side called Hydra, and very sweetly invites um, large group of the art world to just um, to spend the weekend on Hydra and I've been recording it for almost 15 years now and so it's kind of it's just a very nice moment when people come from all over the world and they're in a small island and it's a strange and you just you have this concentrated world that I can photograph very easily but one of the things I like about Tracy Emin in this picture is that thing when somebody's face is completely covered and it's entirely to do with the body language and also she's so sanctimonious and puritanical about smoking now it's quite nice to see a cigarette <laughs> sh shoved in the mouth. <laughs> Douglas Gordon. It's, it's somehow, um, I mean, in all these pictures, there's such an obvious sense of intimacy. And I just wonder if you could just tell us a bit more about how you've approached these artists, many of whom would not be photographed by anyone. Yes, and usually most of them probably think they don't want to be photographed. They only yeah. allow themselves to be photographed because nobody's going to see the photographs in the hate press. So we're <laughs> showing them now. Um, I got into taking photographs in the mid-90s because I, up until, I'd been an art dealer for about 15 years and just had one of those sort of uh, career change. I just needed to change my career. And I had no idea what I wanted to do. And I was just very, I knew quite a lot of the young artists, but I had no idea. I, mean, I, just, I could sense something extraordinary was happening energy-wise in London, and nobody was really ph photographing it. So, I'd never take, taken pictures before, so I just started going out with a camera and just using a point and shoot and photographing people um, in the early hours of the morning. And these are all kind of quite early pictures, and people get sort of a little bit grand about them and say they're very immature and they're kind of bad, and there's nothing of real quality about them, but I think they, I'm very fond of them because they capture an energy that existed at the time. So can you talk a little bit about that? Because this, these pictures, ultimately ended up, or well, many of them ended up in your book Spitfire that was published in 97. And this is Dick Star, if I understand it, exactly. from um, the Atlantic Bar and Grill. That's Gary Hume on the left, Abigail Lane on, it, on his lap. But what, what, when you refer to that period, how do you remember that sort of energy at that time? I, um, I, as I said, I didn't know what I wanted to do in my career. And there was a book published in the 60s called Private View, yeah. which Lord Snowden did the photographs, and Brian Robertson, and I can't remember who else, um, who else um, did the writing. But it was about the London art world. It was a, it's a, it's a big format 60s book. 
And I always thought it would be a great idea if somebody did a new one. And my original idea was to edit the book and commission professional photographers and professional writers to, to fill the pages. And Thames and Hudson liked the idea, but it never really got anywhere. And eventually they turned around and said, well, why don't we just take your snapshots and turn them into a book? This, this is the, these are images from that book. Well, that's it, that, yes, because that's from Fraser. And this so is it actually had an affair with E.D. Army. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> um, in this picture, which is, um, we, we, I, I, I've got the book upstairs, it's a enormous coffee table book, it was produced in 1965, and um, Snowden took many of the photographs. All of them? Oh, all of them, and in, to, just to the right of this is a, a very large bacon leaning against the wall, so it's a sort of crop of that shot. But I, I remember at the time looking at that book with you, and both of us being amazed, certainly the similarities between this particular dealer and a certain <coughs> London dealer at the moment, Jay Chopling, but it was also that sense of beginning to realise that there had been a certain type of documentation of the art world in London previously. It's, it's, it's an incredibly seductive book, this, but then I think that, you know, it seemed a really good idea to write, redo it in the 90s, um, and then I suddenly realised that in the 60s, the London art world was about London, or certainly it was about the UK, um, and in the 90s, the London art world was just part of a, a global movement. Yeah. And I realised you could to actually try and make a book precisely about London art would be a, 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 shooting yourself in the foot slightly. I just wanted to go back because, again, I think some of these pictures probably haven't. Well, that's, that's an interesting one because this is Colony Room, Sarah Lucas, Damien, Matt Collishaw. And that's a sort of continuity because the Colony Room was, of course, where Freud and Bacon and lots of uh, Michael Andrews would, and Michael Andrews did a very famous page painting in the Colony Room as well. What, what, what's happened to that print when you, when you brought it in? It's, half of it's been burned. It's, it went up in flames in my flat, and fortunately I noticed it before the flat went up in flames. So. <laughs> have, you ever, have you ever had problems with artists who have said, I absolutely cannot be photographed by you or have that? No, just not to worry about them. Just <laughs> 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 And that's Actually, no, I, mean, I think you're, you're as good as your reputation, and I'm very, very, very protective of negatives, and that's why I never syndicate photographs, because I realise I'm given a very pr privileged access, and the idea that if somebody was doing a hatchet job at an artist and then went to a syndication office and said, I want that, that picture, and, you know, it was used, I would just feel like this sort of let down the artist in some way. But also, I mean, many of these artists, as I say, who are very capricious, don't always want to be photographed by certain types of photographers, but artists, in this case, like Tracy Emin, actually have this hanging on the wall of their studios. Yeah. And, and, um, yes. I mean, I have to say, what it's always fun photographing artists quite yeah. near the beginning of their career because they have less... They don't, at that stage, not quite... Sh you know, now Tracy is so aware of how important her image is in her career. Yeah. Um, but in the early early days, people were much more reckless. Yeah. Um, and I've noticed now that a lot of the people I've used to photograph, um, now if I photograph them, they kind of want to see the pictures first. And in the old days, they never worried about that. Yeah. And it's, um, it was in talking to you, Johnny, about this book, I remember we, we, we were both sensing at this particular moment in time, by which I mean the sort of mid-90s and, and moving into the late 90s, that there, there was a sense of great energy, people going out an awful lot, and, um, and in referring back to these pictures of, of Hockney, it seemed, I, I, I think we, in our conversations, it felt very necessary for you to go out and photograph those artists, and I think you were a absolutely let in I just wanted to show the kind of old ways in which artists were documented here on the left. Is it, this is from a book called Art Scene, which Paul Hamlin brought out in um, uh, around about uh, 68, 69. <coughs> on the left is Yasha Reichart, who was one of the directors of the ICA, and on the right is Anthony Fawcett, which some people may know from the Max. Uh, that's him in, in, in his early 20s in the sort of Pink Floyd mode. Um, and then we come to you. And it's it's interesting to see how after Spitfire you also, I mean, your photography has evolved immensely, I think, in that sense. I mean, yeah, I mean, that's just because I had absolutely no technical training or knowledge whatsoever. So I started off with point and shoot with automatic focus and flash. And then 
I realized that the pictures were becoming terribly repetitive. And I realized I had to learn my craft. And to, to, you know, it sounded a bit boring, but I thought actually what, learning to use a manual camera was an important step I had to make. So you know, I, I, a, friend of my mom, a friend of mine's mother gave me a twin lens Mamiya. And that's how, and I've actually did that I fell in love with twin lens and you know vintage cameras and I've used them the whole time now. Uh, would you describe yourself as a technically minded photographer? Useless. Absolutely <laughs> useless. <laughs> um, this was taken in Suffolk with Sarah Lucas and Don Brown. And this is when I was getting completely out of control because this is actually this is me using a five by four uh, Linhoff, which is a kind of you know, you have to load the cartridge slightly. But it, it, what's quite good about using a um, manual camera is where you have to do a light meeting meter and set it up on the tripod. They come the complete opposite of the early pictures because they become much, much more considered. I mean, any spontaneity yeah. goes out the window, but you get something much more worked out. In this is a, a picture that I know Sarah Lucas refers to as the enthusiastical. She sees uh, herself and Don Brown there as being very carried away with their tea. Um, and again, this, it, this, this sort of intimate relationship that you've had with the artist over the years, which in this case sees it sort of rather quiet and sedate. And well, that's the Tracy, the Tracy Evan Museum. And actually at the time you didn't realise that now it is quite rare to see Tracy actually making the work herself. I would imagine she, I mean, she probably has this army of people doing that for her. But in these days it literally was her with a sort of needle and thread. She does have uh, an army of people and she also has a, a lap pool in her basement of her studio now, which is uh, a, another interesting departure. Jim Lambie, you like this picture a lot. I'm not yeah. saying I don't, but what, what is it about it that attracts you? I, 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 I just, I, I don't even know why I like it. I just do like it. It's an instinctive thing. Um, and it's that thing about the relationship between a photographer and sitters. I think it's much more like John Deacon, who is, I mean, the Snowden pictures is, you know, he was a jobbing photographer working for the Sunday Times magazine and thing. Well, Deacon was, um, who photographed the School of London, he was much more a drinking companion, an insider of, of, of the group he was mm. And he's, he's a photographer I like much more than Snowden. That's the show. How do, you, how, how, do you, how do you how do you do you have an idea of what the artist is like in your photographing that then at the moment they've been sort of almost a cartoon version of themselves, or is it just that you're what are you looking for in this, for instance? Because all you've got for the most part is Tweety Pie, isn't it? Really? <laughs> but this is on Hydra again. I you know, honestly I don't you know I think that the when you start going through the contact sheets and choosing pictures, mm. um, your mind works probably more um, sophisticated, in a more sophisticated manner than when you're actually taking it. Because when I'm doing something like this, I'm going click, 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 click. Yeah. I'm not, probably not even looking. But this is, um, I remember having dinner with Richard Prince, and I, you know, he's a grandee. And I just thought, if you don't ask, you'll, you know, you won't get. And I said, can I come around to your hotel and take some pictures? And much to my amazement, he said, yes, turn up at five. And when I arrived, he just said, um, Johnny, I bought this outfit this afternoon. Would you like me to wear it? <laughs> so it's you and carriages in a, in a, a hotel room alone with Richard Prince. Exactly. I bet you were glad it was that outfit. Absolutely. And it was very nice. And then when he had the big, his big retrospective of the Guggenheim, that was the only image he used, which wasn't a self-portrait. That was a really weird project. Um, Angus Fairhurst, Sarah Lucas, Julian Waring, and Michael Landy were doing a group show in Iceland. And they said, would I do a group portrait of them? And we, we met in Hobson Square and drove through Whitechapel to the Iceland supermarket. <laughs> 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 Where they walked around with lots of plastic bags for the Walker's Crisps, wearing uh, Viking. Uh, Viking helmets. Oh, right. <laughs> Kareth with Evans camping it up. I mean, Kareth is, is, is well known, or, well, not well known, but his, for his father having photographed him constantly, if I'm correct, as he was growing up, his father was a photographic enthusiast and then and just took millions of pictures of his. Which means he, he performs with the camera constantly. I mean, he, he surely 
does. That's again another one of these photographs from Hedra. I think that's a very special picture, this one. Well, it's uh, John Curran and Rachel Feinstein in New York. This is ages ago, this is the mid 90s ago. And it's when they were looking, I mean, they're a very sexy couple. I think he's very sort of John Boyd and Midnight Cowboy. He's never really looked better. And I guess, again, it's completely technically inept. You know, it was got a, there was no light. You know, I love it, that's what I love using about film as opposed to digital, yeah. is that you have no, somehow the limitations of light, the limitations of the film can work in your favor, and it just has a mood to it, which you've never had a digital. What, what do they say? Have you shown this? They, they've seen this. Image. Yeah, they love it. Well, I think, yeah. I mean, there was a picture earlier of them. They were yeah. kind of, they, everybody's always going to love pictures of them looking that hot. <laughs> That's of Sam at the Hayward. You had the show at Saturday Night at the Hayward, and I think those very, very simple pictures where there's absolutely no gimmicks. It's literally somebody locking, locking eyes with the lens. Uh, then, then the pictures you can't do it unless you have some sort of relationship with the, the sitter. If you, if you walked up to a stranger and asked, mm -hmm. you know, if you were commissioned by a magazine to photograph something you'd never photograph, you just couldn't get away with it. But I love that pared down simplicity. It's got this sort of petrifying work the concrete from the Hayward walls. It feels like one of those great American was a Dor Dorothea Lang or something yeah. as well. You've you stepped back at one point to make a series of works and um, I think you've, you've exhibited these. Yes I have. This is I mean, I'd like to say so, you know I devoted a lot of time, I think it was half an hour on Bond Street. It was um, I was went swimming in the morning and I, came, I, I, I cycled through Bond Street and it was the 1st of May and they were expect, <coughs> expecting riots. So there was a, uh, basically all the big stores that devote hundreds of millions of pounds to promoting themselves as a brand for one day a year go to huge lengths to cover up their corporate identity. And it was a, it was a very strange thing of going down Bond Street and it was, you know, that thing of obliterating their brand, but at the same time they were kind of quite beautiful, they were almost like sort of Kurt Schwitter's um, collages. Can we tell which one this is? That's absolutely yeah, that blotted out. Yeah, that was completely... I think that was Mont Blanc. <laughs> but it was, I mean, it was just a fortuitous, it's literally half an hour, and the police kicked me out after a while. You would become very, you'd become very known for those sort of, as it were, YBA shots at that at that time so I think there was a definitely sort of second second album problem you know that you can't just keep on telling the same story again mm. and again and again and also I think you know I could have started photographing the next generation but I think you what happens is one generation of artists has a generation of curators has a generation of dealers has a generation of chroniclers a generation of critics and and it's, it's that sort of a magic that happens. And I didn't want to become like other photographers who were desperately trying to find the hot, hot new thing. Mm. So I kind of, I just have stuck to my generation, with exceptions. And therefore I needed to find myself another story. You, you were talking earlier about um, Bond Street and, and the fact that you were uh, uh, working with art. You were working at the Fine Art Society yeah. for many years. And I know you're someone who has a, a very, um, uh, 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 it's very passionate about certain periods of British art, which is why Paul, Nash. Name, Paul Nash appears, because I know this is a work that you enjoy very, very much. But also, not just the fact that it's Nash, but I'm also quite fasc very fascinated by the First World War. And another project which I did, which uh, you don't have any illustrations, which is one of the best stories I've ever done, which was photographing the last 21 survivors of the First World War. And they were all between 103 and 106. And I spent about a year traveling around, um, which was an extraordinary experience, really extraordinary. How, how, how did that, did that manifest itself? Or was it, it, was a, it was a series of interviews and the, the, yeah. the pictures, but they're really beautiful pictures. I mean, it was a real, it was an extraordinary experience because when you're dealing with people that old, you can't really say, look this way, smile, <laughs> perform, you know, have a wave now, do that. Um, it's kind of like traveling across and photographing a chair or, or a piece yeah. of furniture, and, but, incre but incredibly moving, and they were very, very extraordinary people. When the, the last of them died not so long ago, 
as a Harry Patch. Yes, exactly. You, you, you met him yeah. as well. Yeah. But the most extraordinary one, if there's ever a moment in, as, in my career as a photographer which made me think, now I know why I want to be a photographer, I mean, why I'm a photographer. It was a major, like, incredible magic. I went the whole way to Wales, and it was a stormy, wet day, and it was absolutely horrible. And there was this guy in a wheelchair who was sort of wheeled into the conservatory, and I tried to take pictures, and they weren't going anywhere. And, you know, he was 106. And the rain stopped, and I said to the nurse, can we sort of photograph him outside? And she said, well, where would you like to put him? And there was a sort of blasted tree. And we put the wheelchair underneath the tree, and I started, started sorting out my camera. And I was just aware that something was happening out of the corner. He was fast asleep. I was aware that something was happening out of the corner of my eye. And I looked around, and this white stallion, which was from about half a mile, just walked across this field, and came up to the fence, the barbed wire fence, and he sort of arched his neck and nuzzled this old man who woke up. <laughs> and his fingers came up like that, and the sunshine came through his <laughs> And the horse of it. And then I went back to London, and I was listening to those Johnny Cash albums. Yes. They're going around and the, 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 and it's, it's like the white horse and the name it had on him was Death. It was the angel of death. Okay. He was dead a week later. Oh, you yeah. know. Which is extraordinary. Um, this is The Men in Road by Paul Nash from 1919. <coughs> and this is oh, this is a very interesting picture. It's by Roger uh, Fenton called The Valley of the Shadow of Death. It's from 1856. Well, this is very interesting because somebody's written a book about photography recently and they found two different versions of this. Because this is you know, the charge of the light brigade. In the first version, there's not quite so many cannonballs. Oh. And the second one is, you know, obviously somebody's been sent around to put lots more cannonballs onto the road. And it's an interesting thing about yeah. playing with reality. Does it diminish the image by knowing that it's been tweaked some yes. way? Because you actually, when you're... Whenever you look through a camera, you're tweaking in some way just by the process of framing and, and, yeah. and cropping. So I, don't, I think, you know, by placing a bit more, it just makes it a more extraordinary image. I mean, I, I ran off and found this because I knew we were going to be um, talking today, but I remember you once said to me it was, it was for you one of the best photographs of war, a depiction of war you don't you know. Yeah, partly because it's, wonder, cause it's usually with all paintings and drawings and photographs of war, it's all about people. Except for some of those extraordinary images of, um, of the First World War. So the fact that there's no one in it, um, you know, the corpses have been dragged away. <coughs> and it's an extraordinary image. Oh, it's Sickert. Sickert, who I know you also admire. Not Ambrosiana, I think, as well. Thank God you pronounced that for me, Johnny. <laughs> Well, I um, yeah, I just I, I, I love sickness. I mean, it's it's the whole world as a sort of the musical um, something we really have has just totally disappeared. I mean, I suppose the pantomime today is the last sort of residue of of this sort of the theatre world of the Victorian era. And also, kind of rowdy sort of gang. That's this Minnie Cunningham. Dr. Minnie Cunningham at the Old Bedford Hall. And then we move on to Naples. Yeah, I think that's, you know, when I said, you know, I realised that I was beginning to repeat myself a lot and I needed, you know, a lot of people was, was, you know, saying that, you know, I had great access, so in a way, if you're using an automatic camera and you have great access, you would have to be a bit of an idiot not to get interesting pictures. Um, so I needed to go somewhere in the world where, one, I used a manual camera, so I could, would learn my craft and also go to a part of the world where I didn't know anyone, I didn't have any access. So it was, for me, it was a sort of rite of passage, so a rather belated one. And you, you, been, you started going to Naples even in the late 90s, while... No, I think I went in 99. Was 99, the and then... Yes, I went. And then I, over the next decade, I... Um, so you've been you've photographing there for 10 years, weren't you? Yeah, but intermittently, I just go back occasionally for... Three you know, times a year, yeah. Something like that. And this is... I had an exhibition at the Estrick Gallery last year, and they wanted to use that last picture for the poster on London Underground and it was banned because it was advocating graffiti. <laughs> <laughs> These are the, goal, the goals that they have. Uh, um, well, the Apollo ones have that fantastic ingenuity. If you've got nothing, you just use nothing. So just the, the, the goal, goal posts on the church gates is just very beautiful. How comfortable did you feel as a photographer with the, the 
a nice box camera walking around naked. Yes, um, it's, yeah, it's great because they didn't, they didn't know what it was, they didn't bother stealing it. <laughs> I've been in Naples where if you put your jacket out, if you're outdoors and you put it on the, the back of your chair, children will just come along and happily remove every item from your... I know, but they can tell the difference between a real Rolex and a fake one. It's <laughs> fake, so <they're> just... <laughs> These, chaps. these are young chaps on the public beach in Naples, and you know th 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 what I love about it is the way they respond to the camera. In England, they would be doing that, or, you know, <laughs> but also they kind of they know they look good, and they just have that extraordinary self confidence. Their body language is very southern and you know, policy, but also I think when you go into an old collection of old master paintings in yeah. Italy and you see the way that the saints hold themselves, yeah. you see that the artist literally took it from the streets, you can, you know, you can, that's you know, the body language of a titian or something. This is the public beach, this is pure Fellini, um, in, they don't really like space. No, open <laughs> space. <laughs> Absolute nightmare for me, something like this. But there, there she is. Just, I mean, it must have um, struck you as quite a, an extraordinary moment. Do you? Are you literally scanning around for these things? I tell you what was a real, real disappointment about it, because this kind of street photography is getting more and more different. When I first started taking these photographs, the Neapolitans would be offering their children to be photographed. Photography. By the time I stopped this body of work, you know, we would have a camera. It was like you must be a paedophile. I mean, I think the paranoia of a man with a camera is, 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 is just become too dangerous. <laughs> this is really funny. Um, the, the, there's a sort of, on Saturdays, um, brides and grooms go and have their photographs taken on the waterfront. And I was walking past, they just somehow, they go on to have, you know, in her wedding dress, she'd taken the stockings off to stand in the water. And as I was walking past, this, you know, the bathers were getting their dress back into it. I mean, one, one thing photographing artists who you sort of know, but in these situations, do people have you ever been chased down the street? Well, no, because the other thing is because I felt very much an outsider. I just sort of you could if one's if one's sneaking shots, there's something patronising about it. So usually I ask permission, yeah. which means you lose spontaneity, but quite often you get a great theatrical flourish instead. Yeah. So I would have gone up to her and said, "Do you mind?" And she would just gone go ahead. That's just as we can carry a mirror in the city. La familia. Absolutely. Mm. Health and safety. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but this, this is a bit... Oh, before you do that though, please um, tell us what's going on in this picture. It's quite amusing. Uh, Neapolitans don't see themselves as Italian um, at all. They kind of hate, ever since the unification of Italy, they've been sidelined. Um, but this is the one exception that Italy had won the World Cup and I just happened to be there at the time. And Italy beat France and that's the coffin of France being carried <laughs> through <laughs> with the French flag on top. Now this will need some explaining in the next series of photographs, but um, by all means please do. This is, uh, there's a, there's, I suppose you get it elsewhere, but there's something called Feminelli in Naples, which are basically guys who've had osmosis cosmetic surgery from the waist up, but not from the, there's no, nothing's removed from the waist down. So that basically they earn their living through prostitution, but they also fulfill a sort of shamanistic role in society. So this is Lotto. So if you were to have a dream during the night, which is a bit like bingo, if you were to have a dream during the night and you dreamt of a cockroach with a broken leg or something, you would go to the Lotto office. The Lotto office was the oldest book of which has numbers corresponding with, uh, you know, numbers corresponding with objects like a cockroach and things. And you'd say, what well, I dreamt about a cockroach with a broken leg, and somebody would look it up and they'd say 23 or something. And then when you've had your dreams and, and you've got your set of numbers, you then go to play lotto, yeah. and you call out your numbers, and it's presided over by a feminieri. Traditionally, this was called Patrizia. And it's very raucous and very vulgar, and everybody's shouting and screaming. But in a weird way, this sort of half man, half woman is a sort of conduit between the corporal and corporate and the spiritual world. Mm. And and in the next picture, I think, is a much more extreme version of this. One's called Rusalella. And she was a sort of she shim, she him. It was a kind of 85 year old, tiny little kind of feminine. And um, she goes through a sort of birthing ritual. 
And you, we went to her flat in the Cartier Espagnoli, and she, she was sitting there in her nightie and puts a wig on, and then asks us to get the doll out of its wrapping. And then she, she sort of went into labor, and when the water started to, what do they do? Burst, <laughs> Burst. Burst. Break. break, that's it. They kind of, she break. went to the window and shouted out, help, help. <laughs> and then after a while, other feminine come and help with confinement, and then you should go through the whole groaning, and out comes the baby, and then she lies there, and she rocks it in her arms, and then she wanted me to come to the church to bless the, the doll, which point I just thought I'd had enough. <laughs> <laughs> but I, you know, it's, it's really weird and really primal, and the writer of Malaparte wrote about it in the book called The Skin, Penny, in 1947, where just outside Naples, he goes to this community of Feminelli, and you have the same thing happening, but there's literally a hundred feminine helping him with the environment. And very oddly, after he's given birth to this sort of totem baby, he reverts with masculinity and all the kind of veins start coming out of his neck and his voice goes deep and it all gets very aggressive and machismo. And it's probably a sort of it's a fecundity ritual that goes back way, I mean, thousands and thousands of years ago. I would imagine this is the last practitioner in Naples. Did you, I mean, it, 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 you were there for several hours in the whole process. So an hour. Just blend, and a, and blend I, in. It was, you know, yeah. you could look at it as being a bit Benny Hill, but it it wasn't. It was sort of, yeah. it was deeply disturbing. Yeah. Not half because I saw things I really didn't want to see. <laughs> Again, this is almost like, when you look at Roger Fenton's photographs and you see the way that soldiers in the Crimea respond to the camera, they have a kind of, there's a sort of, they're sort of the, the camera still held, had some magic, they respond to the camera with respect yeah. and pride. Mm. And I think Neapolitans do the same thing. You, you know, anywhere else in Europe they would be smirking. Or something. But when you go up to a soldier, they, you know, you say, can I take a photograph? They just stand to attention. The very nice century. I'd like to, um open it up to, to, the, uh, to people to ask questions after one last image because I think in, in, in recent weeks um, there was a moment of radio silence where um, Johnny Shanker could not be contacted and I think it was partly to do with taking uh, no, an not. image coming up here. Yeah, I, just got, to, I got given a fantastic job which I was just beginning to work on which is photographing world leaders and somebody said, come to Kabul on the 10th anniversary of 9-11. And it was a very extraordinary position to be in, going into the presidential palace to photograph Karzai. And that morning, we were staying in the safe house, I said to security, what's the word on the street? And they said, well, the Americans have up security 75%. They're expecting attack, which is a little bit nerve-wracking. But I just thought, you know, the one thing the Taliban aren't going to do is attack whenever it is expected them to do so. And we left the next day, and the following day, the Tuesday, they went berserk. There was multiple suicide bombings throughout the city. But it was an ex extraordinary experience. I mean, I'm very happy with the picture, but in a way, the experience of being in Kabul for three days was the more exciting than taking the picture. It's a very noble picture as well, as you were saying earlier. But t t tell me more, so it's the beginning of, of, of a series of images of world leaders. Of world Here's leaders. You in Kabul. Well, so this is the number one. I mean, I'm yeah. waiting to hear what number two is. But um, it's not just going to be political. It can be military. It can be cultural. It can be media. It can be science. It's two. This is, I'd wait for the next phone call. Has he seen it yet? Not yet. It's an amazing picture, I'm sure it would be. Yeah, it's, um, it's very interesting photographing heads of state because, you know, you, you know, with an artist or with a Neapolitan, you can sort of tell them, yeah. look this way or more weight on your left hip. Or yeah. But with a head of state, you kind of, um, you kind of, it's a bit, actually the training I had in photographing the World War I veterans was quite good for this. It's kind of, you turn up, you don't know what conditions are going to be, you don't know what the access is, you don't even know if they're going to be asleep or whatever, awake. You just had to photograph what you've got. And the other thing is, you know, heads of state, the idea of being in a good photograph hasn't even entered their mind. It's, you know, it's, yeah. it's a propaganda thing, it's a didactic yeah. thing, or it's an illustration. I mean, I had this flunky saying, but we must have the Afghan flag behind him. And I said, no, 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 just keep it. So I think it's be very interesting to see how it goes on, and if I can get, manage to get interesting pictures out of people who aren't interested in being interested. How, how long were you in his presence here? Really? This picture, I think I had three minutes, three, five minutes. And no assistant and no lights, just 
you know, pit camera on the tripod. You don't want the Robert Kappa moment where the film is ruined when you get home. Sort of well, I was, I was very nervous because I, you know, I did take a digital camera, which I completely screwed up on. I think my success rate was about 3%. Um, but this is using traditional. But one of the problems with using film now is that when you're traveling x-ray machines, especially in a place like Afghanistan, mm -hmm. you can just destroy the film, so you don't know whether you're going to come back with ruined stock or not. That was so briefly, I did put in two other shots because I just wanted to talk with you about the distinction with other photographers, perhaps of your generation or ilk, as it were, but Mar um, yeah, Mar yeah. Jürgen Teller uh, from Mark Jacobs here. I mean, you said, you, you've always said to me something very interesting, which is that you could always tell a Jürgen Teller picture. But, but absolutely, I think it's, you know, that, that, that he uses a flash in a certain way, and it always has this bleached out quality. And there's always you know, a huge sense of humour about that. Um, but the other thing about Jürgen, you know, he's a fantastically successful fashion photographer, and that's, yeah. it, it's not just because, I mean, he makes the product looks good, good. I mean, he somehow manages to make it ridiculous and desirable at the same time, which is quite a balance to get right. And quite extreme in terms of the interaction between the photographer and the subject, when yeah. someone gets Charlotte Rampling covered in caviar naked. Yeah, but I think it's yeah. Jürgen. Yeah. Charlotte Rampin playing the piano with Jürgen on all fours and naked with a tulip up his ankle. So yeah. it's just, where did that come from? <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, Mario Testino, photograph of Kirsten Dunn. Which is, yeah, I mean, I, I, what Mario does is not what I want to do. Although this one is, in a way, a snapshot, it is quite nice in the early ones. But you have to say, you know, what he's set out to achieve, he hasn't achieved 100%. So I have to, you, know, you have to just have great respect for him as a commercial photographer. I was actually talking to somebody the other day, because I always think usually with photographers, you, you can think of one image which epitomizes the, them as a photographer. And I've always had a problem with Marita students where I'm thinking, what is the image which is the quintessential Testino image? And I was talking to somebody who works with him a lot, and he said, actually, when it happened was that when Tom Ford started designing for Gucci, the first collection, it's the sort of early days, and he didn't quite know where himself where he was going to take it. And that it was when Mario started taking. He took that collection and shot it very Brazilian, very sexy, very just total eroticism mm. and glamour. And that kind of defined for Tom Ford where Gucci was to go. So he was very influential. In, I mean, if you're, if you're not interested in fashion, that's it of no consequence at all. But that was apparently kind of his great it's, it's, it's also interesting in terms of the photographer's relationship to their photography in relationship to their work. Um, in this September issue, it's amusing, I think, to see Mario just, you know, almost about to get told off for having not taken enough photographs on a very expensive shoot. But I mean, you, 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 even if you told him off, he wouldn't even notice. No. <laughs> I mean, how, how, do you, how, do you see, how do you see photography, final question, in, in, your, in relation to your life? Is it the first thing, or is it, is it, is it a it's casual it's relationship? It's, 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 I mean, people always, whenever I'm abroad, say, are you here on business or, or, business or for pleasure? And I just say, there's no, there's no division between the two. I mean, I'm very lucky in that respect. I mean, this is a byproduct of my life. That's wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> um, if anyone would like to ask any questions, um, uh, by all means, please do. Um, or we can just uh, adjourn, and then you can always ask Johnny something uh, uh, informally, if you wish. Um, but for now, I would just like to say that's great, Johnny. Thank you very, very much. Very interesting.